Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I'm here because I used to come here as a kid and I really enjoyed it. I want to give back to it. Alligator hunting is it's just not like anything else I've ever done. I don't want to get anxious, get excited, you get nervous. So I'm going to take my alligator meat and make sure it's nice and full, but you want to leave enough room so that you can take the ancho chili and wrap it back around the meat. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. One of our main concerns starting out was the dead timber and the threat it posed to people out here at the park. It's just been a collaborative effort out here to get this park back on its feet. In September 2011, a wildfire devastated a Central Texas community and burned 95% of Bastrop State Park. Months later, flash flooding furthered the damage. It was pretty traumatic seeing this place. After the fire and probably for five, six months, there was just uh, very little life out here. As staff scrambled to reopen the park, it was clear restoration would take time and more than a few helping hands. After the fire, we got a phone call that said, we need help and we need it quick. Um, and we were able to get a crew out here <laughs> beginning of November. All right, are you guys ready? Yes. We're doing well. American Youth Works Texas Conservation Corps immediately went to work, controlling erosion, clearing debris, and reestablishing park trails. A lot of dead trees, so they're out there making it safe, they're making it passable. That one? Yeah. And the Widowmaker right there. Started walking the trails, felling all the hazard trees. Back cut! <laughs> that was the primary focus. Falling! To reopen the park in a safe manner. And then we moved into building bridges. Keep the public on the trails, keep them safe. It protects the toad habitat and any other part of the ecosystem that's affected by the water. John, volunteer. At the work site, a bridge is beginning to take shape. Please. Leading the crew is Colin Foltz. I think people are capable of a lot more than they usually think they are. And when you get a group of people, young people especially together, that haven't really done all this before, and then you have them lifting heavy logs and stuff, they all find they're a lot stronger than they thought they were. One, two, three. Each bridge is different. Lift it up and then and then dropping in. Yep. There's not one cookie cutter size of post that's gone in. Stand it up. So there's definitely a learning curve and that's part of that leadership development, part of that personal development. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks higher. <laughs> I think it is higher. It's not just here are the skills, but here's how you figure it out. Closer. Nope. We get things done little by little. There's always things that don't quite line up the way that they should line up. Okay, you got it? I think that's part of the growing experience of this kind of work. You learn a lot about yourself. Uh, yeah, it was awkward. How did we do this before? Yep. You all right? Yeehaw. Yeah, we're all good. It's good. Sweet. You can definitely see the progress as you make it. We do have the motivation and the energy yeah. to be out here day in and day out. Careful, man. energy is amazing. Working on public lands on almost less than minimum wage, it's really not about the money, it's about serving. Each crew member serves roughly 950 service hours. It's just kind of a way to better yourself and the land around you. 
using a core of young people to restore a forest and make it accessible is not a new idea. In fact, it's as old as Bastrop State Park itself. In 1934, the Civilian Conservation Corps constructed the park and replanted its pines. Today, this Texas Conservation Corps and similar crews around the country are part of the National AmeriCorps program. A few little live ones. The idea of service on a national level, this is what made our country. AmeriCorps is practically based off the CCCs, so this is very much a return to that. Just a few generations later, here we are back out here, kind of doing the same thing. It is a very similar concept. Well, the CCC did some amazing work building this park, and then these young men and women have been doing an outstanding job. Though some of the tools have been updated, along with gender roles and hairstyles, much of the work remains the same. I'm here because I used to come here as a kid, and I really enjoyed it. I want to give back to it. This looks great, it really does. Crew members all have their own reasons for being involved, but there are some common themes. By the time I graduated, the whole recession thing started happening. I'd much rather be out in the woods than, than in a city. I've like lived in pretty big cities, and, and doing this, uh, like I said, it was a challenge for me. It was something that I felt I needed to do. <laughs> Autumn Reynolds joined because she likes working outdoors. Okay. But she later learned she has a special connection to this park and its past. There we go. My great-grandfather was in the CCC out here, so um, I'm kind of just keeping it in the family. I found out about this like a week before I was coming out here, so I had no idea until he even mentioned it. So that's pretty cool. how we go to work every day. <laughs> the crew often commutes to work, but for some stretches of time, they stay at the park around the clock. We'll go over that more later. Anyway, dishes. We are setting up our camp. And then, not like that. This goes on somehow. Whoa, full assembly. That doesn't make much sense. Mm -mm. It's gotta go the other way. We gotta figure out how to get it together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, look Boom. at that. Hey. It's like bowing that way. This will be my bed for the next nine days. <laughs> All right, what do we want for dinner tonight? You ready? S K E T T I. Skeddy. Oh, Another day. It's hard to wind down at night. Yeah. After everything we've been doing. <laughs> the crew rises before the sun. You guys ready for PT? And gets ready for action. Okay, running in place. Working so closely and intimately with other people can be real challenging. It's jumping jacks. But by the end of their term, this group works as one. They have forged strong connections with each other and with the land they have helped restore. When they saw a Bastrop State Park recovery crew, local Texas young people signed up. We kind of gained ownership over this park. To be here all the time, it's become our park. 1934, these things don't change that much, huh? It's our crew's last day out in Bastrop. 
gather up all our tools, take them back to the office. It's like almost anticlimactic. Yeah, it's a little sad. One more crew may be leaving, but the year's accomplishments are clear. Hundreds of hazard trees have been marked and cut, miles of trails have been stabilized, and a seventh bridge nears completion. Yet some of what they have built together is harder to measure. It is a work ethic that they can take with <laughs> them. Fun. We'll always be in touch with these guys and we'll always know that we went through this together and we'll see each other again soon. I'm definitely bringing back some lifelong friends. Yeah, I can't see Ollie. Oh, there we go. Ready? Run, run, run! run up. You guys ready for your next pose? <laughs> the holes to dig, stairs to build, tools to clean up, people to ridicule. Doing a terrible job. <laughs> Walking backwards is really safe. <laughs> I didn't make this decision. I definitely got a lot more training now. <laughs> I can use a chainsaw now. Um, that scares the crap out of my family, but I can do it. To help the recovery at Bastrop State Park, or to learn more about the Texas Conservation Corps, visit these websites. This is the J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area, and it's summer in the marsh. This is one of the best places in Texas to hunt alligator. Alligators usually have a small area that they'll use, so you can kind of keep an eye out and set your line where you actually see an alligator. Every September, a hundred or so lucky Texans get drawn to hunt gators here. The J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area is roughly 24,000 acres of wetland habitat. If you don't know your way around the J.D. Murphy WMA, it can be difficult to get around. Everything at times kind of looks the same. And it's in a part of Texas that a lot of people have not explored before. That's definitely the case for these three. Meet Spencer Burke, Scott Moore, and Terry Skull. Yeah, he was just right here like about a seven footer probably. The area that we're hunting in, it's a, it's a vast bayou of swamps and marshes with canals running through. The adrenaline rush is way more than deer hunting or, or anything else because you're after something that can actually get you. There's one probably about 10 foot and two seven footers right up here, about 150 yards we're gonna try to put a set. Spencer has hunted gators before and is taking Terry and Scott out for the first time. Come up here trying to sneak up on some uh, alligators and see how big they are. Let's see if there's any slides or tracks. You gotta run right here. Yeah. So he's coming, it's coming right up here. Well, we do alligator hunting because it's just something unique, it's different. There he is. Pretty good one too. We're out in sort of a harsh environment with the swamps, the mosquitoes, the alligators, the snakes. It's something you just can't do every day. I like this over here. It looks pretty good. Using a long cane pole, He's almost got it. the idea is to attach the bait to a roped hook and dangle it just above the water. How high does that look? 24 inches? No, 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 no. no. That's too high. That's way too high. If you put it too low to the water, the small gators will, will knock it down or even turtles can get to it. That's good. Perfect. 
I think this spot's good. We've got the wind direction that'll carry the scent down the uh, canal. And uh, we've actually got a gator down there looking at us right now. Mr. Alligator's down there just waiting for us to leave so he can get snack time at 3 o'clock. I like it. Good job, Terry. <laughs> Deeper into the marsh, Spencer and Terry set up their poles. I don't know, kind of get excited. Never been gator hunting before. Come out here and see probably 10 gators so far. You, you know, you see them on TV and, and uh, see the alligator shows, and this is exactly what it looks like where they're traveling in and out of. Our bait is chicken thigh quarters. Those smells savory. It's savory, that's for sure. Mm. And we let them sit out in the sun for a day or two, and they got quite ripe. Upwind's better than downwind when you get those things out. I like putting my bait about 18 inches above the water. Hopefully, we'll catch a little bit bigger gator. Oh, that hey, smells man. terrible. I offered y'all some of this stuff. Man, that is putrid looking, man. It stinks. That's going to get one. Yep. Hopefully, we've got them high enough where we'll get some big gators and we'll go see what we got when we get out there tomorrow. In September of 2008, Hurricane Ike bore down on Texas. The hurricane not only wiped out parts of Galveston and the upper Texas coast, about 100 miles to the east, a storm surge hit J.D. Murphy with a wave of salt water. It was real eerie the day after Ike. You know, you go out, there was no birds, there was no frogs, nothing. It was, you couldn't hear, it was just complete silence. It was kind of nerve wracking. It killed alligators for months after, you know, Ike landed, and it just devastated the landscape. But over time, J.D. Murphy has recovered. Now this coastal marsh is back. Prime habitat for not just alligators, but for wading birds and wintering waterfowl. Biologists gauge the gator population by checking nest success. Well, the nest is over here, and it looks like there's a few. Uh gathered up over here. Usually they stay by the nest for quite a while. And these guys are days, if even hours old. Little bitty guys. Hard to imagine this guy getting 10 feet long. Oh, my net, they're going right through my net. <laughs> <laughs> this year is the first year since Ike that thing kind of got back to normal. Uh, we had more nesting uh, than we had in probably eight years this year. So that's a good sign for us. It's really neat to see them, not only just to be able to see all these little baby alligators and, and be here just moments after they've hatched, but just to see our numbers rebound shows that, that we do have huntable numbers and, and we have a, have a population that can support a hunt. It's almost like Christmas morning, being a little kid waiting for Santa Claus to come. You ready? We're all pumped up and, and ready to go see what we got. Woo! I had trouble sleeping last night. I was so excited about checking the lines. I think we're going to have some gators on this morning. Hey, we got one, guys. Oh, we got one? Yep. Ooh, he pulled out all the line, too. Here we go. He's not wanting to come now. Here we go. What do you think, he's seven foot? He's over seven foot. Oh, you're just anticipating, you don't know, really know what's on there. And he's pulling against you, and you're fighting against him, and all of a sudden he shows up. Well, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then it's on, then. When he sees you, you see him. I am amped up. Adrenaline's pumping. All right, Spencer, whenever you get ready. Santa Claus was good. <laughs> Looks good. No line left. In the end, it was a successful morning, as all three had a gator on the line. All right. Alligator hunting is its just not like anything else I've ever done. Hold on tight, Terry. OK. You know there's one on the line, and you start pulling me in. And I don't know, you get anxious, you get excited, you get nervous. Not happy. And you don't know if you're going to catch an alligator until you pull it up, and you really don't even know how big it's going to be. Hold on. That's big. 
his tail's on the, on the bottom. I can feel his tail kicking off the bottom. We were quite surprised today. We've got a, a good eight and a half footer, a seven and a half footer, and probably six and a half footer. Smile, smile, smile. One, two, and three. Excellent. Good job. This is a great experience. If you like to hunt and fish, or, or even if you know, you're just interested in something that's completely different than maybe anything you've ever done, I would recommend it for sure for anybody who hadn't done it. Hi, this is Jeff Martinez from El Chile Cafe and Cantina in Austin, Texas. I've got an exotic recipe for you today. We're going to be using a little alligator. Now most of the time when you get alligator meat, it's either going to be the jaw or it's going to be the tail. And if you can see here, I've got some alligator tail and it's got a lot of muscle running through it. So what I've done is I've taken the meat and I've ground it up in my food processor and that's what we have right here. And so what we're going to do with this today is we're making an alligator ancho chile relleno. I've got a hot pan here. We're going to start by adding some extra virgin olive oil to the bottom, just enough to coat the bottom of the pan. Swirl that around, make sure it's hot. If you see smoke like that, you're going to know it's hot enough. We're going to add our white onion, which has been diced up. You hear that sizzle, that's what you want. Just like that. We're going to let this saute for about two minutes. And what you want is for the uh, onion to kind of lose its white color, kind of have an opaque color to it and almost browning at the ends. We're going to add our garlic and let that saute for about another minute. Oh, I can smell this already. It's already starting to smell good. All right. So then after that, we're going to add our tomato and let that saute for a couple of minutes until the tomatoes are breaking down. Now we're going to go ahead and add the alligator meat. Now you can use turkey, you can use chicken, you can use pork, just about any kind of white meat can be substituted for alligator if you can't find it. Still got kind of a pinkish color to it. You're going to want to let that keep on cooking until it loses some of that pink color. It's pretty much going to look the same as a cooked chicken. And it doesn't take very long. Alligator is a very lean meat. So the cooking time is minimal, and that's just about it. So we're going to add a little bit more flavor to this dish by throwing in some sliced green olives. That's going to add a little bit of a saltiness to it, a little briny flavor. And then we're going to add some of these raisins. That's going to add a little bit of sweetness to the dish. And we're going to finish it off with slivered almonds that have been toasted. That's going to put a little bit of crunch in there. You see everything in there, it looks great. There's a lot of color in there. A lot of color also means a lot of flavor. <laughs> and then we're gonna finish it off with some fresh chopped parsley. That's gonna add some freshness to the dish. And once you put that parsley in, you don't wanna leave it on the stove cooking for too long because you still want that brightness, that freshness from the parsley. And then to finish it off, we're gonna salt just to taste. And we are ready to stuff some chilies. We're using ancho chilies, that's a dried poblano pepper. So what I've done with these is I've reconstituted them in a mix of hot water and brown sugar and I've let them sit for about six hours and that's gonna soften them up. I split it open, I took out the seeds and I took out the veins. So I'm gonna take my alligator meat and I'm gonna stuff it inside of the chili, just like so. I'm gonna make sure it's nice and full, but you wanna leave enough room so that you can take the ancho chili and wrap it back around the meat and make it look like it's never been opened, just like so. And I'm gonna set that into an oven-proof baking dish. Oh, this smells great with the olives, the raisins, the almonds, everything just smells fantastic in here. Okay, there we go, these are ready to go in the oven. I've got an oven set at 400 degrees. I'm gonna pop these in for about 10 minutes just to heat them through. So these look like they're just about heated through. I'm just gonna finish them with a little Honduran crema and I'm gonna garnish them right on top with a little fresh parsley. So this is our south of the border twist on alligator. Enjoy. <laughs> 